on Reason Radio. So there's a crisis. There's a crisis right now. We need to move fast, move fast, shut everything down, close businesses, end a lot of your freedoms, a lot of your liberties for right now. Get inside, get inside, okay? No no time to think about it, no time to even question, no time to be strategic. Let's do this right now. Quick, 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 quick. Hurry, hurry, crisis, crisis. You know, there's this treatment out there that could possibly work for a coronavirus patients. It uh, had some... Good results in some places. Hydro, hydroxychloroquine with z That might work. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> Slow down. Slow yourself down. We don't want to move too quickly. We need to make sure it's effective and all this stuff. But but I thought it was a crisis. I thought we had to move. It is a crisis. Let's end your liberty. Let's end all your liberty right now. But well, we could possibly work in the crisis too and get people this medicine no 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 why are you moving so fast why are you moving so fast that's incredibly irresponsible president trump interesting how that works right i think it's beyond reason this is beyond reason radio i'm your host michael yeffy the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason we are on until 8 p.m tonight right here on news radio wfla orlando of course we're on facebook live as well you can like the beyond reason radio facebook page you can also follow me on twitter at michael yaffe and if you miss any of the show catch the podcast anywhere that podcasts are available and of course mr tom benson is in the control room with me how are you tom i am doing just fine and it just crossed my mind for some reason out of a clear blue sky Bill Clinton is quarantined with Hillary. <laughs> why? I, I'm not really sure why that crossed your mind. Do you honestly think they're quarantined together, though? Well, Do you think they're actually They've together? been happily, well, not semi-happily married for... <laughs> I mean, I've heard that they've had separate bedrooms in the White House. So I have a feeling they're there. Mm-hmm. They're in separate sides of the house. Mm-hmm. If they are... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, where, where Tom Benson's mind goes, you just know, never... It's, it's everywhere. You just never know. So we are going to talk a little bit about what I think is some light at the end of the tunnel. Aha! Uh-huh. Now, the last show, I begged Tom Benson to talk me off the ledge. Uh, I remember. Because... And I did. <laughs> because I thought we were all doomed, and I thought it was really bad. But I've actually seen some things recently Mm -hmm. that i think might be sort of a light under at the end of the tunnel but great i have a caveat with that of course there (laughs) that's for the next show (laughs) (laughs) he's not surprised i'm a little pessimistic um there's also a little bit of darkness at the end of the tunnel as well Mm. it's not completely lit up there's some light sneaking in there which is good and hopefully it'll get even more as we get closer. But there is a little bit of darkness in that at the end of the tunnel I, well, I want to get into. Do tell, do tell. So uh, we, w- we will get into that. But I do want to comment real quick in this hydroxychloroquine controversy. Mm-hmm. In fact, uh, let's go and play that first cut up there. President Trump yesterday, I think, made a reasonable point on this. I can't believe how much the media is blasting him on this. Here's what he said. But we don't have time to go and say, gee, let's take a couple of years and test it out. And let's go and test with the test tubes and the laboratories. We don't have time. I'd love to do that. But we have people dying today. As we speak, there are people dying. If it works, that would be great. If it doesn't work, we know for many years, malaria, it's incredible what it's done for malaria. So he's exactly right. And he's and everyone's saying, no, 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 the epidemiologists say don't do this, even though there are some doctors out there that are highly recommending using this treatment because they say it works. They say it's saving lives. Even Governor Cuomo came out recently and said, you know, there's some promising uh, new results with this with this drug. Mm-hmm. But the media, they keep blasting. Over. It's an untested. It's an unverified, untested prescription. And. Does anyone else find this ironic that we have been in such a rush 
to shut everything down because of this virus, to end all of your liberties, to get you inside your home, to arrest you if you even walk your dog in some cases, if you're not social distancing. And Governor Ron DeSantis was a little reluctant to do that. He didn't do it as soon as some others because he's not in a rush to take away your liberty, which I think is a good thing. And yet, we're in a rush to do that. Oh, DeSantis, you didn't go far enough. And then DeSantis says, okay, well, one thing we can do is get this strong. Let's get out there right now. Oh, no, 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 no. You're moving too fast. It it just stuns me, the hypocrisy. I saw a meme today that said, basically, shut down the national media for 30 days and 80% of our problems will go away. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, can we <laughs> shut down the media? Exactly. You know, a mandatory shutdown of the media. Don't don't even joke about that. They'll call you a fascist, Tom Benson. Oh, they won't, they won't understand you're actually just well, kidding. Well, that's just it. They, you know, they, how long have they been writing on uh, Trump for having fascist-like uh, dictatorial uh, directives? You know, and then the time comes when something like that may be needed, and they say he's not moving fast enough. You I know. know. It, and they say we need a nationwide shutdown, which is unconstitutional. But they're they're really bothered that he's not doing this, even though one of the states that didn't do it is uh, is Wyoming, mm. which they've been social distancing since their founding because there's not a lot of people. I think they have thirty four now in the state. Yeah, I mean <laughs> it's it's not necessary yeah. there, but th- I mean that's that's how they think. So. The good news, Tom Benson, a little bit of good news. Yes, yes. Let's start with the fact that it seems like the cases in New York are starting to flatten, and mostly New York City. And Governor Cuomo uh, addressed that a little bit today. Do I have that cut up there? Go ahead and play it. It is hopeful, but it's also inconclusive, and it still depends on what we do, right? Uh, These models all have a coefficient of what we do and how successful we are at social distancing, et cetera. And from our decision-making point of view, it doesn't really matter if we've hit the plateau or not, because you have to do the same thing. If we are plateauing, we are plateauing at a very high level, and there's tremendous stress on the healthcare system. So he's, you know, it's it's sort of, kind of good news i mean we're looking for anything at this point but he's saying there's a plateau there which means we could be at the top of this curve and eventually once we get over this plateau we'll start seeing cases go down so that's that's really good news the other good news is here in the state of florida they have moved the curve once again they thought the peak would be maybe Mm mid-may and now they're saying mid to late april which is a big deal. It shows that what we're doing is working. Now, the other thing that I think is really good news, although, like I said, it's just these small little tidbits I'm noticing, but I'm trying, Tom Benson. I'm okay. not trying to be all pessimistic. Um, what's it? I have Dr. Fauci as the next cut, right? Yeah. Dr. Fauci, I, know, I was listening to him on Saturday, and he said something that I was like, finally, We're talking about this because it was just a week ago or so that if you even mentioned some of this stuff, you didn't care about the sick and you want you just wanted people die for the stock market. Right. If you start even discussing how we could possibly open things back up because we don't want the economy to collapse. Oh, you just care about money in the stock market, huh? You just want people to die. You're not reasonable. Why do you want to do this in between approach? But then I heard Dr. Fauci. President Trump talked about this, too, but I wanted to play Fauci because I haven't really heard this from him as much in the beginning. You know, uh, there was one interview where he said jobless numbers were an inconvenience, unemployment. It's, it's a little more than just an inconvenience for millions of people right now. But he did say this at the task force briefing on Saturday. Here it is. Hopefully the kinds of mitigations that we're talking about are going to have the impact to allow us to begin to think about maybe changing a bit. So what we need to do, and I believe I said this before, but it's worth repeating, that what we need to have in place, and we will have that in place, is that as you then pull back, you have to have the capability of, in a very pristine, precise way, do the kind of containment when you do see it. Because remember, when you get to mitigation, 
containment takes the back seat because you're just struggling to mitigate. But when you get it down, you need to make sure it doesn't resurge. So that will require the ability to test, to identify, to isolate, and to do contact tracing. That's what we have to have in place, and hopefully we will at the time that we then pull back. So that was a little bit of a montage. I put two cuts together there. But what he was saying, he's actually discussing how we could possibly pull back on some of this mitigation. And he was actually putting forward some ideas, a plan on how we could partly reopen the economy. And to me, this is, it's a little bit of good news, a little sliver, but it's good that we're actually having this conversation. And it's things really that I've been saying for weeks that the main thing we need is more testing, more tracking, different things different ideas of how you open up somewhat while you're still fighting this virus before there's a vaccine. And the fact that the Trump administration is actually willing to have this conversation is a good thing. And another thing that happened is Dana Perino on Fox news actually tweeted this out. She said, this was a few days ago, April 3rd. She said, I think we need a second task force assembled at the direction of the president to look ahead to reopening of the economy made up of a nonpartisan bipartisan mix of experts across industry sectors so that we have the recommendations and plan. Let first task force focus on the crisis at the moment. Mm -hmm. It's a great idea. Trump retweeted that and said, great idea. So that's something that could be coming soon as well. These are conversations that we need to have because the economy functioning properly is important it is about your life at that point another thing that gave me a little bit of hope is bill gates so the founder of microsoft bill gates he um he's kind of got a lot of attention recently because he was big on pandemics years ago back in 2015 you know he did a big speech on the fact that he's really worried about a pandemic hitting the u.s so they think he was very prophetic about what's happening now well he was on fox news sunday with chris wallace And he actually mentioned, similar to Dr. Fauci, some ways that we could possibly reopen the economy sometime in the near future. Here it is. Uh, And so, like China, there'll be a partial opening up, uh, which some jobs will resume, school will resume, but we'll have to be very, very careful not to have the rebound uh, until the vaccine comes. This isn't the worst case. That is... The 1% or so case fatality rate uh, when your medical system is not overloaded, if this was smallpox, that would be like 30%. So this is super, super bad. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we will eventually get a vaccine. Even before then, if we do the right things, we'll be able to open up uh, significant parts of the economy. If we do the right things... We'll be able to open up significant parts of the economy. This is all good news. I mean, if Trump said the same thing, they would be blasting him. Oh, absolutely. (laughs) That seems I was just thinking the same thing. (laughs) But at least other people are starting to have the conversation because we need to have the conversation. So there's some light at the end of the tunnel. I don't think we're going to be shut down forever. I don't even think we're going to be shut down for like six or eight months, as some people were kind of suggesting. Not too long ago, because that would be completely destructive. And we're starting to have this conversation now. There is some darkness at the end of the tunnel, though. Here it some comes. things I'm I, I started with the good news, Tom all right, Benson. All right, all right. I, I could have been all pessimistic today. So we'll get to that in just a moment. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. If you heart Beyond Reason Radio. Listen to the Beyond Reason Radio podcast on iHeartRadio. Just download the iHeartRadio app and search Beyond Reason Radio. The voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason is back now. So I was trying to be positive, you know, in the last segment... And by the way, I'm on Facebook Live. You can like the Beyond Reason Radio Facebook page. I'm always posting stuff on there. 
And I played those Bill, that first Bill Gates cut because I, I was trying to be positive. He was talking about opening up the economy eventually. Mm-hmm. You know, a little mm-hmm. sliver. Well, someone commented on the Facebook Live video. Justin says, Gates isn't to be trusted. Ah. His eye is on how to profit from this. He downplays any other potential remedy outside of a vaccine, which is what he's financially behind. Uh-huh. So a uh, way to burst the bubble there, yeah. Justin. Jeez. Trying to be positive, optimistic, light at the end of the tunnel. And no, mm-mm-mm-mm-mm. Gates only cares about profits. <laughs> so, Follow the money. <laughs> so well, I, you can't say I didn't try. But, you know, there was another thing. On that note, actually, I wanted to play another Gates cut here because this is kind of some of the downside right now. Here's what he said. It is fair to say things won't go back to truly normal until we have a vaccine that we've gotten out to basically the entire world. And so, you know, the best people at the foundation uh, who are all about uh, high volume vaccines, you know, are working with many manufacturers, uh, not only on the safety and efficacy, but getting that uh, billions of dose capacity. So that's kind of the bad news. I think there's still a lot of people out there that believe once we start going back to work, we'll start kind of going back to normal. And he's saying, look, until we have a vaccine, things are not going to completely go back to normal. We'll open up some, but in a lot of ways, no, it's still going to be pretty. They're calling it a boomerang effect. You know, we may relapse. Well, that's the other issue as well. And that's something I've been asking since the beginning. If we open up, what are the chances that, yeah, people are just going to start catching it again, and then we just do the same thing, we close it again? Are we just going to keep doing this for months? I feel like that's just going to cause a lot more panic in the long run, which is why I've been against a lot of these shutdowns to begin with, because I think at this point, we have ratcheted things up so much that any more we're doing is really just causing panic. It's not really stopping the spread of the virus. It's just causing panic. But here's what what I really wanted to talk about when I say there's some darkness at the end of the tunnel. Because when I'm saying at the end of the tunnel, I'm really looking past coronavirus. What's really coming in the future? Because that's what I always think about. Where does this lead? What precedents are we setting for the future? Not just in a couple of weeks or a couple of months. I'm talking years down the line. Hmm. You know, even maybe the next generation. And what really worries me about all of this is I feel like we are setting a precedent. This is now how we deal with crises in this country. Shut down everything. Shut down everything. We now and do it quickly and don't ask questions. Don't ask any questions that say, you know, you're kind of taking away my liberty here. Is this really all worth it? What do you want people to die? And we say, you know, and some people will respond, oh, well, this this is a specific circumstance. It wouldn't be like this for everything. Do you trust your government leaders to to be like that now? Oh, well, in the next crisis, they won't act like that because it'll be different. I don't trust them. The Democrats will be running the show. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. You know, and that's what I really worry about. That in the long run, we have now set a precedent in this country that safety and comfort is more important than liberty and freedom. We have set that precedent. And I'm not saying we shouldn't have done anything. I'm not saying uh, we should have just let this thing go on, have no mitigating effects, whatever. But we got to the point very, very quickly in this country where we went from Liberty, freedom to everything being shut down very, very fast. And a lot of people didn't ask questions. We just all panicked and we just bought into it. And now we're here. And even though this was all done very, very quickly, it's not going to go away quickly. You know, our freedoms were taking taken away in two weeks time, but they're not going to be given back to us in two weeks time. It's going to be a while before we start getting some of this stuff back. And so many people are totally okay with that. 
they're totally okay with the fact that our freedom has been taken away. And, you know, one extreme example of how things ratcheted up so much is San Diego. I have the sheriff cut up there, uh, mm-hmm. Tom Benson. Yeah. The San Diego Sheriff's Office over the weekend, they put out, they basically fined people for watching the sunset. I kid you not, for going out in their cars, separated from people, watching the sunset. And there was example after example of places around the country where people were getting fined or even arrested for doing stuff that would in no way spread the virus. Here And then the sheriff's office in San Diego put out, the sheriff there put out this video on their social media. They're proud of this. Here it is. Over the past couple weeks, our deputies have gone out on foot and provided physical copies of the public health order as well as the executive order to educate our community members and businesses. And now we've gotten to the point that we've had to escalate and now we're doing enforcement. A large group of our deputies and detectives did go out and conduct enforcement for those who are violating the order. These were not recommendations that came down. These were actual orders that our deputies have gotten to the point now to where we will, we will enforce and we're going to continue to be doing enforcement. And it's, it's not that we're trying to be mean or, or, exert unnecessary authority it's we're dealing with the crisis at this point and we want compliance from everybody because this is lives that we're trying to save the quicker we can shut down this the spread and this pandemic the quicker that we can all get back to a normal life i do want to assure everyone that we serve at the north coastal command that the services that our deputies are providing has actually improved. It's increased. We have more deputies that are out in the field right now than we have ever had. So please continue to call if you need our services. We have an abundance of help for you. So she's nice, but we're not trying to be mean or exhort too much authority. This is just a crisis. We have to do this. We have to save lives. They're always going to use that as an excuse to take away your liberty. There was nothing those people were doing that was worth finding them. They were in their cars watching the sunset. There were stories over the weekend of a woman went out for a drive. Mm -hmm. She was fine for it. A guy went out paddle boarding by himself in the ocean. He was arrested for it. A guy took his kid to the playground with nobody. Actually, I don't even think it was a T-ball thing. They weren't even on the playground. They were just playing T-ball. Yeah, he was handcuffed in front of his kid. Handcuffed in front. What is the point of this? The point is, you didn't listen to our authority, so we have to do this. It's not mitigation. It's, you didn't respect our authority, as Cartman would say. I mean, it's and we've set a precedent where we are willing to give up our liberty for a little bit of safety. It reminds me a little bit about the price of gasoline. How often do we see the gas maybe even go up 50 cents overnight and it takes like six weeks for it to come down a trickle, you know? Yeah, That's exactly. like, you know, taking away your, your, your liberty and your freedoms and giving it back. Mm-hmm. It was Ben Franklin who once said, remember, you've heard this before. Yes. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety and he's probably rolling around in his grave Hmm. right now this is beyond reason radio i'm your host michael yaffe we'll be right back if you miss any of the show you can download the beyond reason podcast on itunes This is Orlando's Smart Talk Radio. Beyond Reason Radio continues now. So earlier in the show, we were talking about um, the fact that there are some calls for a nationwide shutdown ordered by President Trump, a nationwide stay-at-home order. And I said, why is that really necessary for a state like Wyoming, you know, where they're really spread out, the population's pretty low, they have a low number of cases? And uh, my sister (laughs) was listening and she texted me and she goes, yeah, the only one in Wyoming who are getting coronavirus are the cows. (laughs) So I was like, you know, those cows are not social distancing. That's the problem. They're not following those CDC guidelines. They need to be arrested. 
those cows and taken in. This is welcome back to Beyond Reason Radio. Take them to the slaughterhouse. <laughs> I'm your host, Michael Yaffe, the voice of reason in a world that is beyond reason. By the way, I don't know if any cows have coronavirus. As far as I know, I don't think they can catch it, but who knows? The tiger in Brooklyn at the zoo caught it. Yeah. So apparently they've done studies in the country to see if your pets could catch it. And there's no evidence right now that pets are getting this. Mm -hmm. But I mean, it's it's early, so that that really could change. But I want to get back to a little bit of uh, what I was talking about in the last segment, giving up uh, your freedom for a little bit of safety and security. And there are times where we're willing to do that a little bit. You know, after 9-11, that was an example. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was thinking about this, and a lot of people don't think about it this way. They think, well, I have the right to life. So if we have these freedoms that could cause me to be injured or die, that's taking away my liberty. And I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of liberty because freedom is risky in some ways. Freedom includes risk in many ways. In order to have freedom, you have to have some risk. You could totally take away everyone's freedom and in some ways yeah we would be safer but would that be better well you know what they say freedom ain't free <laughs> exactly right it's there's a risk involved with having a free country there just is i i would love people one thing that really influenced my life in this regard in middle school i read the book the giver Really popular book. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a future dystopian world. Okay. But in the book, and there's a movie out about it now, it's there they live in this so-called perfect world where there's no pain, no suffering, um, no hunger, anything. It's like this utopia. But there's this kid who has to do this job where he receives the memories of the past. Ooh. And he realizes that he was living in a world also with no color, no overcoming obstacles, no real fun, no love or sex. And it was a real eye-opening. That was the one that really hit Tom Benson. It was a real eye-opening. I'm living in that world now. <laughs> <laughs> for different reasons, of course. Unless, unless your wife uses that as, well, this is for our safety. Yeah. <laughs> There's this virus going around, Tom. <laughs> Keep your distance. But, you know, in the book, it's very interesting because he's like, this world that I've grown up in is wrong. I want all these things mm -hmm. that, yes, might cause pain mm -hmm. in the long run. You know, when you're playing a sport, you might break an arm, but you still want to play the sport because it's fun. And I think of that way in terms of our lives that freedom is worth it, but yes, there are some risks involved. And it seems like more and more during my lifetime, we are willing to just get rid of the risks or get rid of the risk by getting rid of our freedoms. And then we think that's okay because I'm safe now. And that worries me. And I don't think we realize what we're doing. Now, there was a great piece in The Federalist that you'll find interesting. If we're going to go down this road, and when I talk about setting precedents, Okay, we're going to go down this road that we need to get, we need to shut everything down because of a virus, because of a crisis. Okay, well, what do we do next? It says here, 12 ways to save millions of vulnerable American lives by banning more things. Mm -hmm. It says, just think of that. We can save nearly 2 million lives every year with these personal and collective sacrifices. In addition... We can prevent an estimated 100 million sicknesses and injuries by banning these 12 things. So the first thing, very obvious, ban motor vehicles. Ah, we should do it. You know, safety causes accident. Federal accident. data shows that more than 2.4 million Americans were injured in car crashes in 2015. More than 37,000 people died in car crashes in 2016. And of course, there are injuries and all that. We should ban Cars. Is this a Greta list? <laughs> <laughs> I know. You know, the insurance companies, some of them are giving back some of the premiums. I saw that. Because they don't have to worry about crashes. I'm telling you, 
the left is going to start using this more and more to say we need to s- s- limit driving in this country. Yeah, reparations. They, <laughs> reparations. Here's the next one. Ban touching people. Ooh, we're Mandate there. Mandate mask wearing. We're <laughs> and it talks about not coronavirus, but the flu. The flu, the seasonal flu, is spread by touching, coughing, and sneezing. So no touching uh, from, what, November through the end of April. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no touching. Yeah. I mean, I'm kind of okay with that, actually. But uh, in, in the 2017 to 19 season, 61,000 Americans died of the flu. 810,000 Americans were hospitalized with the flu in the last flu, in uh, the couple of flu seasons there. Mm-hmm. Here's the, ooh, you'll like, you'll just love this one. The next one we should ban here. Ban sex. <laughs> oh, a woman wrote this list, huh? <laughs> it says an estimated 110 million Americans have a sexually transmitted disease. The CDC estimates there are 20 million new STDs contracted every year. In 2018, 37,832 people received an HIV diagnosis. In the United States. Wow. So um, we need to ban. We need to ban sex. It says 700 U.S. women die in childbirth every year and 50,000 nearly die. So banning sex would save lives. Yeah. Wow. So, well, I mean, we have to do it. You know, safety. That was another. Yeah. So it's just it's just like the giver. People need to read that book. The giver. Another one. Ban abortion. OK, obviously that that's just an obvious one. I'm going to skip. We should do that anyway. Um, Another one. And this is something that we've seen in the past by some on the left. Ban corn syrup, sugar, and trans fats. We have to, but I have the freedom to eat it. Nah, yeah, but you know what? We we, we need to worry more about your safety and security in your life. Who cares about your freedom? uh, American corn producers are subsidized something like $4 billion a year for products that fatten and kill Americans, namely corn syrup. More than 87,000 Americans died in 2017 as a result of diabetes, and 647,000 died of heart disease. So, you know. Well, if we don't ban it, let's tax it. Oh, <laughs> they've already done that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> New York, that's Philadelphia. Yeah. That's always the thinking mm-hmm. with some of the left. We have to limit your freedom. We have to limit your freedom. Uh, here's another one. Ban tobacco. It's an obvious one. All tobacco. Let's ban it. You know, on that note, kind of a side note here, I find it incredibly ironic that we're doing all of this, the stay-at-home orders for something we're not even sure exactly how bad the virus is, how much all this is going to work, if it was worth it. Yet the same people who want to do that say we should legalize marijuana. (laughs) Yeah. When we know that marijuana has some damaging effects. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Some people get arrested and has some negative effects on society as well for it being banned. But we know that it has some damaging effects, but we have decided, yeah, but you should have the freedom to do it. So for a drug, you should have the freedom to do it. But when there's a virus, you shouldn't have the freedom to do anything else. Does this, does this come under the banner, uh, do as I say, not as I do? <laughs> mm-hmm. I just think it comes on the banner of uh, priorities and irony. Yeah. You know? So, but tobacco was another one. Let's see. What's else on this? Ban fast food. You and I wouldn't just go hungry, I guess, Tom Benson, because uh, that's all we eat. Wow. <laughs> Meatloaf sandwiches every day. <laughs> Meatloaf sandwiches. Lame <laughs> meatloaf sandwiches. Uh, this is an interesting one. Banned playgrounds. Ooh, yes. Mm-hmm. Unintentional injuries are the third leading cause of death for Americans and the top cause of death for children ages 1 to 14. 4,000 children from 1 to 14 died of falling alone in 2017. Those teeter-totters are killers. Yeah, time to get rid of them. Mm-hmm. We should go protest outside playgrounds. For your for the kids' safety, you get arrested right now. Yeah, but yeah, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> get arrested for anything. Uh, here's the one in this, and we knew this was. They already do this, which is why the precedent they're setting with the virus is kind of disturbing. Mm-hmm. Ban guns. Oh yes. 
39,773 persons died from firearm-related injuries in the U.S. Yeah, you have the Second Amendment. Yeah, you have freedom and liberty. Yeah, you should be able to protect yourself. But, you know, we care more about your safety and security. So we need to ban that. You don't need a gun. Yeah, you don't need a gun. You don't need fast food. You don't need... But but what about my freedom? What about my rights? Rights? No, no, no. This is about needs. That was written back in the <laughs> Dark Ages. Exactly. They didn't know what was going to happen in 2020. Oh, here, Here's an interesting one. Banned cell phones. Ooh. Now you're getting close to home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, the U.S. Department of Transportation estimates that distracted driving, the leading cause of which is cell phone use while driving, caused 3,477 total deaths. Uh, teen suicide, the epic increase of teen suicide, they say, is a result of cell phones because of social media and stuff. Thirty one it's increased 31%. Um, so we should ban cell phones. <laughs> so there you go. And the last one, you'll love this one. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually sure you'll love this one. Ban work. Ah! <laughs> I guess we should. And maybe the government wants to do that. We're just all going to be in our houses. Just send us a check every month. Or it's of the government. Yeah. yeah. And they'll, they'll, they'll provide us what we need. Remember yes. that. Need. Not what yes. we want. What we need. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes, Michael Dev. Yeah, for you don't need this, but here, take this instead. <laughs> yeah. In 2018, there were 5,250 work-related fatalities in the United States. Um, that is five. It says here that is 5,250 too many for a compassionate modern society to tolerate. All work must cease to prevent this from ever happening again. Solution is simple: ban work. Oh wait, the government has already done that for at least 10 million Americans. <laughs> for right now, yeah. But this is what I'm saying: we're setting a precedent now. Where if there is a crisis and the government says they deem this is a crisis and we need to protect our safety, we're going to order you into your house and we're going to arrest you if you even go out, even if you go out to look at the sunset. And we're going to do it in the name of safety and security. And if you ask the question, well, you don't care about people's lives. I'm not saying coronavirus isn't a concern. I'm not saying we shouldn't have done a lot of this stuff. I'm not saying we should ignore it, but we have to remember and we have to question how much of our liberty we are giving away to the government. Their main goal is not to protect you from disease. Their main goal is to protect your rights. And they're not doing it. And there's another old saying... Give them an inch and they'll take a yard or a foot. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I'm your host, Michael Yaffe. We'll be right back. Listen to the latest episodes of Beyond Reason. Download the podcast at Spreaker.com. The place where we talk faith, culture, and politics. Beyond Reason Radio continues. Yes, so welcome back to the show, everyone. This is Beyond Reason Radio. I am your host, Michael Yaffe. In just a moment, we'll have something that made Yaffe laughy. But I did want to go over uh, some things that I found very interesting when it comes to China and China's involvement in all of this. Mm -hmm. Remember last week I was talking about the fact that you live by identity politics, you die by identity politics. You've said that many times. Yeah, there was people in the beginning, like Senator Tom Cotton, who were sounding the alarm on China when they were going through this at first, and they weren't giving us enough information, and they were lying and all of that stuff. They were sound. Tom Cotton's like, China can't be trusted on this. Oh, you're just xenophobic. Oh, you're just racist. Why do you hate Chinese people? So, no, no, it's not about Chinese people. It's it's the government. They're a corrupt communist government. And one thing that uh, Tom Cotton pointed out is that there is a lab in Wuhan that studies infectious diseases. Really? And we don't know for sure, but there is a chance that maybe this escaped from a lab. Hmm. Well, he was ridiculed for it. It was all conspiracy theory nonsense. You just hate Chinese people. He's got that tinfoil hat on. Mm Mm-hmm. And the reason why they said this is they looked at the study 
Well, they looked at the virus and they said there's no evidence in the virus itself that it was man-made or something. It seems to be a naturally made virus. Came from a bat. Now they're saying a pangolin. And then maybe somebody ate that or something and it spread to a human. But here's what's interesting, which they didn't think about. All the people that are blasting Tom Cotton for that. Just because it's a natural virus that possibly came from a bat doesn't mean it didn't escape from a lab. They're Hmm. assuming it came from a wet market, but no, there were studies in China going on before this outbreak went at the Wuhan lab where they were hiring for people to study infectious diseases in bats. Which means, yes, it very well could have came from a bat that was in the lab and being studied in the lab and then released on somebody because they didn't do it right in the Chinese lab. And then the Chinese government tried to cover it up. As we know, there was one journalist who was silenced by the Chinese government for merely pointing out that the pandemic there was a problem. The person disappeared, I think. Mm -hmm, He disappeared. Some thought he was put in a quarantine center without having the virus. So he would end up getting the virus. That was the non-breathing section, I think, of the hospital. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Goodbye, buddy. Yeah, exactly. Sick. So, and there's more and more evidence that, you know, maybe Tom Cotton was onto something and he was ridiculed for it. Finds it very interesting. We can't depend on China anymore. The good news is China, a lot of these companies that do business in China, they're not going to in the future because they don't want to risk this happening again. So it's not going to take a lot of government action, I think. But just so you know, okay, something that made Yaffe laughy. (laughs) So, found this in the Atlantic from Caitlin Tiffany. America is thirsty... For Anthony Fauci. Now, thirsty and cool young person lingo is like, they have a crush on him. Oh, They find him attractive. Oh, he's hip. What is, about, what is it about a crisis that can turn even a 79-year-old immunologist into a heartthrob? <laughs> Says here, somebody put on a Twitter, a Fauci fan said, Dr. Fauci is the total package. That's from Fauci Fan on Twitter. Intelligent, kind, handsome, literally so good looking. OMG. <laughs> Says all day Americans go online to fess up about crushing on Anthony Fauci, the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. They dig up college yearbook photos and evidence that he once played basketball in short shorts. They added though his Wikipedia page, swapping the main photo with one taken 13 years ago. <laughs> okay, everyone, calm down a little bit here. All right, uh, you know I like what he's doing for the most part, but I, <laughs> uh, I mean it's his confidence and his calmness in the crisis that women just love apparently so apparently dr fauci is the new sex symbol just so you know thank you all for listening to the show today um if you miss any show catch the podcast anywhere podcasts are available and i'll see you guys tomorrow